Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, a very warm welcome to this evening's lecture. I'm John King, founder of the Shrewsbury Darwin Festival, and it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker. Before we start, a quick word on the format for today. If you haven't already joined one of the lectures during the, the current uh, festival, at the bottom of your screen is a Q&A button, and you can use that to post any questions you have at any time during the lecture. Uh, please state your name and where you're joining us from. At the end of the lecture, if we have any questions, I'll be putting some of those to our speaker in a short Q&A session. Well, our speaker this evening is Penny Ward. Before retiring, Penny managed Shropshire's historic sites and monuments record, and over a period of years brought it kicking and screaming into the 21st century, not just computerizing it, but also using GIS to map it, placing the record in the landscape and providing invaluable context. Well, since then, she's become a stalwart of the Friends of Shrewsbury Flax Mill Maltings, and it's on that subject that she'll be talking to us this evening. Penny, welcome. And over to you. Ah, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my talk tonight is about some of the leading figures involved in the early years of this remarkable complex of buildings on the northern edge of Shrewsbury. the world's first iron-framed building. In 1796, the Leeds-based flax spinning partnership of John Marshall and Thomas and Benjamin Benyon took on Charles Bage as a junior partner, and they charged him with building a fireproof mill in Shrewsbury. The resultant building, now known as the Shrewsbury Flax Mill Maltings, was the world's first multi-storey building with an internal iron frame. So what were the key elements of this revolutionary building? Well, there were cast iron columns, cruciform in cross section, which slotted into each other all the way up, up the building, as you see in this uh, diagram here. Um, uh, and they uh, ran uh, down in three rows along the length of the building. And crosswise, they supported cast iron pairs of cast iron transverse beams um, which were joined just off centre here with massive great nuts and bolts and these were the really crucial innovation uh, at this stage. The third element in the um, uh, 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 iron frame were these wrought iron uh, tie beam, uh, tie rods uh, which uh, pulled together uh, the uh, or restrained the uh, brick arches which sprang from these flanges on the beams and uh, supported uh, brick floors. Uh, the whole idea was to build a fireproof building by eliminating exposed wood. So there were no uh, wooden beams, there were no wooden floor joists and no wooden floor boards. Now, who was uh, Charles Woolley Bage? Um, well, he was baptised in Derby, Derby in uh, 1753, the son of Robert Bage, who was running the Darley Abbey paper mill on the outskirts of the city. That same year, the family moved to Elford, uh, just outside Litchfield, to the paper mill there. It was probably in the late 1750s that Robert Bage first met Dr. Erasmus Darwin, then living in Litchfield, and they remained friends for the rest of their lives. Darwin's second wife later described Robert Bage as Dr. Darwin's very particular friend. Now, like his Lunar Society friend Darwin, Robert Bage strove for self-improvement and to expand his understanding of the world. An example of this is that in around 1760, he engaged Thomas Hansen of Birmingham, a surveyor and astronomer, to teach him mathematics. In 1766, Robert Bage entered into partnership with Erasmus Darwin and others in an ironworks at Wichnor. Um, this was an iron slitting mill where billets of iron 
were flattened with rollers and then slit into bars, rods and plates from which nails and other items could be made. Charles Beige may well have uh, visited the Wichita Ironworks and observed its operation in his teenage years. But then in 1770, we see uh, in the, uh, an entry in the Register of Duties uh, paid for apprentices and dentures. Um, this records that a Thomas Slater and co of Shrewsbury uh, land surveyors um, took on an apprentice called Robert Beige. Now this is like to be a, a clerical error recording the apprentice father's name. And if this is the case, Charles Darwin would appear to have moved to Shrewsbury at the age of 17. Uh, there is a 1774 estate map uh, in the Staffordshire Record Office made by Slater and Beige. And this uh, suggests that uh, Charles quickly moved from apprentice to partner in the business. Uh, Shropshire Archives holds various estate maps and other surveying related documents involving Beige, ranging in date from 1775 to 1792. In 1778, both Charles and his father, Robert, separately subscribed to an inquiry into the original state of earth by John Whitehurst, one of the founders of the Lunar Society and another Derby born friend of Robert. And this is just an image of, of uh, some pages opening that rather, rather lovely book. Um, in about 1788, Robert Beige became a non-resident member of the Derby Philosophical Society, which Erasmus Darwin had established soon after moving to Derby in 1781. Among the other members of the uh, Derby Philosophical Society were the manufacturers Richard Arkwright of Cromford, Jedidar Strutt of Milford, and Jedidar's son, William. Resident and non-resident members could borrow from an extensive library stocked with books on a wide range of scientific and technological su subjects. Meanwhile, uh, in Shrewsbury and Shropshire, uh, in the 1780s, Charles was well getting well established uh, in Shrewsbury. In 1781, he married uh, Margaret Botfill, the daughter of a Shrewsbury uh, apothecary. In addition to his surveying, by the 1780s, uh, he was also trading as a wine merchant. For three years from 1784, uh, he was one of the founding directors of the uh, House of Industry. Uh, as a um, side note, uh, in 1787, Erasmus Darwin's son, Robert, who was actually 15 years younger than uh, Charles, came to Shrewsbury, aged 20, and set up his own medical practice. Meanwhile, in 1789, Charles Beige became a Burgess and so had clearly become part of the Shrewsbury establishment. At the same time, some key figures were coming to the fore in the town and the county. In 1787, Thomas Telford was appointed Surveyor of Public Works for Shropshire and both he and Beige were involved in the building of Shrewsbury Jail, and also we know from the valuation of a church in Maidley. Then William Hazeldine from Shrewsbury was an up and coming millwright, an iron founder at this time, uh, who had established himself in Wild Cop by uh, 1789. In the same year, in the east of the county, uh, Richard Reynolds passed his shares in the Ketley Ironworks to his son William and Joseph Reynolds and it became very much a centre of excellence and collaboration between various innovative engineers. In 1790 uh, John Simpson, a Scot like Telford, came to Shrewsbury as Clerk of Works for the new Church of St Chad's and a few years later took over a local building business. I have indicated that Robert Beige was involved in various networks of businessmen, industrialists and professionals, such as surveyors and doctors, 
who sought knowledge and understanding, not only for practical application in their own fields and beyond, but also for its own sake. In respect of Charles Beige, the evidence is admittedly more circumstantial than that for his father. However, a case can be made that Charles Beige could have benefited in the decade before he designed the Shrewsbury Flax Mill from a likely exposure to this clustering in Shrewsbury and Shropshire of leading figures in the development of civil engineering, construction and ironworking. There was another key figure in Beige's development of his iron frame, and he was William Strutt of Belper and Derby, an active, an early active and inventive member of the Derby Philosophical Society, who actually succeeded Erasmus Darwin as its president. In 1792 to three, he made a major first step in building a fireproof mill when he built a six story calico mill in Derby using two rows of cast iron columns to support timber beams from which sprang brick arches forming the floors. Now Shropshire Archives contains a set of 35 letters written by Charles Beige to William Strutt over several decades. One from uh, sometime in 1796 when Beige was already designing the iron frame and then from 1802 up to 1818 uh, up to 1818. But frustratingly, the earliest letter is clearly not the first that passed between them, and Strutt's side of the correspondence does not survive. It is difficult, therefore, to tell the nature of their relationship at this point, although it does seem well established. It has been suggested that at this stage, Beige did not have much expertise in uh, structural ironwork and construction, and that he was very much dependent on Strutt's advice and encouragement in taking further the design of fireproof mills. Nonetheless, uh, as we can see uh, from this excerpt from uh, the 1796 six letter, um, when uh, Beige uh, describes his use of experimental da data uh, supplied to him by Joseph Reynolds, uh, in order to calculate the strength of cast iron columns under a vertical load, it shows that he was determined to advance his knowledge and understanding by drawing on, on all the uh, resources, both of data and of uh, advice uh, that were available to him. Uh, oh. As well as receiving advice from Strutt, and experimental data from Joseph Reynolds, it seems likely that Beige also benefited, benefited at this time from the expertise of William Hazeldine, because he cast the columns and beams of the iron frame at his new foundry at Colham. And John Simpson, who we know built the flax, mill, the flax mills, Clark's house and the first apprentice house in what became St. Michael Street, and was probably responsible for the masonry walls of the mill. By 1796, Thomas Telford was describing Hazeldine as the arch conjurer himself, Merlin Hazeldine, and both men went on to work with Telford at the Ponkasati Aqueduct. Whatever the level of Beige's expertise with iron, when the Benyon brothers and John Marshall took him into their business in 1796, to build them a fireproof factory in Shrewsbury, it seems he was quickly up to speed. At the beginning of 1800, he visited George Augustus Lee, who was in the process of designing and building an iron framed extension to his Phillips and Lee Salford uh, twist mill. And Lee then reportedly twice visited Beige and the flax mill in Shrewsbury soon after. This may have resulted in Lee's decision to use iron beams in, this, in his building, which is now deemed to be the second iron frame building in the world. And this is the um, extension to uh, Salford Twist Mill uh, uh, contemporary drawing. In early 1801, Beige was um, supplying Thomas Telford with details of tests he'd been carrying out on full scale iron beams 
These were perhaps the prototype for, uh, types for the iron frame fax mill he was soon to build in Meadow Lane, Leeds. In the same year, he was uh, deemed to be one of the eminent persons, including uh, William Jessop, William Reynolds, and John Iron Mad Wilkinson, who were consulted uh, by the committee uh, assessing proposed designs for a new London bridge. Um, uh, and this uh, included uh, a design, an audacious design uh, for a single span iron bridge uh, submitted by Thomas Telford. Um, by 1802, uh, as it transpires, the Benians and Beige were negotiating with John Marshall the end of their partnership in, in Leeds and Shrewsbury. Uh, Beige was busy building the new Benian and Beige partnership iron frame flax spinning mill, mills in both Leeds, where Thomas Benyon was now established, and in Castlefields in Shrewsbury. Um, and this is an image of the, uh, uh, the mill that uh, he built there. In uh, January 1803, Strutt's Mill in Belper, North Mill in Belper, burnt down. And it seems that Strutt started to plan to rebuild with an iron frame this time. Would he decide to use iron beams? To help him decide, in May 1803, Beige offered to submit to Strutt his reasoning on the strength and shape of them, i.e. iron beams. Strutt presumably responded in the affirmative, as in August, Beige duly supplied several sheets of drawings and calculations on both cast iron beams and also of iron roof frames. Uh, and uh, he had not actually attempted to, to put an iron roof uh, on, on the, the, um, the original Shrewsbury uh, fax mill, but, which, uh, but he um, clearly was now looking into that. Uh, perhaps uh, in respect of the uh, mill at Leeds. Uh, and this is uh, uh, an image of uh, one of those sheets with his drawings and uh, the calculations that he sent to Beige. As neither Beige's Meadow Lane Leeds nor his Castle uh, Field Shrewsbury Mill survive, it is difficult to determine the extent to which uh, Beige's final designs uh, for those mills influenced the strut design of Strutt's 1804 North Mill in Belper. Although it seems that the details of both the beams and the roof trusses used by Strutt in North Mill differ from the ideas that Beige had sent him in 1803. However, it has been suggested that the cast iron roof trusses that in Holdsworth Mill in Glasgow, also built in 1804, were based on a triangulated design like that tested by Beige, and also that the roof at Barracks Mill, Whitehaven, built in 1809, uh, apparently does resem closely resemble Beige's experimental designs. These examples may suggest that his efforts had at least fed through into the work of others. I'm go now going to look at some of the other uh, uh, people involved uh, in this pioneering endeavour. Now, uh, the Shrewsbury Fax Mill is linked to John Marshall, as we've seen. He's an important industrial pioneer. He was the man who effectively created a whole new industry by developing the mechanised spinning of fax. He was the son of a linen draper who had seen the rise of the cotton spinning industry, and then it came across a, a machine to spin flax patented by Kendrew and Porterhouse in 1787. Marshall's father had just died and he was looking for an employment where there was a field for exertion and improvement, where difficulties were to be encountered and distinction and riches to be obtained by overcoming them. He started with a, an adapted water mill just outside Leeds, and then in 1791, he and his then partners moved to a new mill in Holbeck and Leeds. Whilst in conjunction with engineer Matthew Murray, he improved the machinery so that it could be used on a large scale, a factory scale. And there's Matthew Murray. And this is a, 
uh, an image from the patent uh, for the um, improved uh, flax spinning um, uh, and processing uh, machinery that Matthew Murray developed. Um, in 1793, Marshall's original partners dropped out, but then he acquired new partners in the Benyon brothers. Uh, and this is uh, a portrait we have of one of them, Thomas, Thomas and Benjamin. Uh, they were woolen merchants of Shrewsbury, but of course the woolen uh, trade, which had been the foundation of Shrewsbury's wealth, um, was in terminal decline. Uh, and uh, it seems they were looking for a whole new uh, business uh, and industry in which to invest. And they found it uh, perhaps through their connections as they were all Unitarians, um, they found it in John Marshall in Leeds. Um, so the partnership built a new mill in Leeds in 1795, only for it to burn down early the following year. Now fires were emerging as a major problem for the owners of textile mills, uh, and, uh, which were large multi-story buildings full of machinery which generated fluff and fibres into the atmosphere and were lit by candles and oil lamps. Although they rebuilt the mill in Leeds, the Benyons persuaded Marshall that they should attempt to build a fireproof mill in Shrewsbury. And they bought, brought Charles Bage into the partnership to achieve this, as we have already seen. Um, although, as previously mentioned, the uh, partnership with the Benyon brothers which had led to the building of the Shrewsbury Mill, had broken down by 1802 and was formally ended in 1804. And the way it turned out was that Marshall ended up absorbing the Shrewsbury Mill into his growing business based in Leeds, where many others, including, of course, the uh, newly formed Benyon, Benyon and Beige partnership, also set up flax spinning mills in the early 1800s. Uh, and this uh, and so in the early part of the 19th century, Leeds became the major centre for uh, the industrial spinning of flax. Um, however, the uh, Marshall Company outlived most of these other startups and in fact lasted uh, until it was closed by Marshall's grandsons in 1886. Uh, and that's when our, our flax mill closed as part of that. Uh, the flax mill motings also present some examples of the early adoption of new technologies and ideas. Um, steam power. In the 1790s, water power was still the main means of driving a factory. And the Shrewsbury Mill is one of the earliest of the new steam powered textile mills that were beginning to be built. Steam power meant that mills no longer had to be built alongside a fast flowing water course. Instead, they could be located in populated areas with an existing transport infrastructure, as was the case in Shrewsbury. And in Shrewsbury, they had the added benefit of the Shrewsbury Canal, which was under construction at the time uh, to bring uh, coal from the East Shropshire coal field uh, uh, into town. And in fact, uh, 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 as we can see from this plan from 1793, the original idea was simply to bring uh, the canal along here on this side of the road. But when the uh, site of the flax mill uh, was purchased, um, uh, it was rerouted at the last minute to bring it across the road and alongside uh, of the actual mill building. Um, but this meant uh, that uh, this canal could supply both the coal that was needed by, by the steam engines and the water for the boilers. Um, Although some condensing steam mills have been installed, steam engines have been installed at textile mills in the 1780s, it was not until uh, they were further refined and became more reliable in the 1790s that they came to be more widely adopted. Uh, as a result, in 1796, John Marshall and his partners could with confidence decide to power their Shrewsbury mill exclusively by steam. And they duly ordered a state-of-the-art 20 horsepower steam engine from Bolton Watt in May 1796, before the site for the mill had even been purchased. Bolton and Watt's last main patent 
uh, on their steam engine was due to run out in 1800. Uh, and it's no surprise to find that the second uh, 40 horsepower steam engine installed at the north end of the uh, mill in that year was produced by Marshall's longtime associate, Matthew Murray of Murray, Fenton and Wood of Leeds, which had set itself up as a rival producer of steam engines in anticipation. Well, this here is a, a reconstruction of the Bolton and Watt uh, uh, steam engine uh, as originally installed. Uh, gas lighting was also uh, adopted at the uh, flax mill. Uh, um, until the beginning of the 19th century, textile mills had to use candles and oil lamps for artificial light lighting. And this was expensive, smelly, ineffective for illuminating large spaces, and as we've seen, increased the risk of fire. Then William Murdoch of Bolton and Watt develops a system of heating coal in the retort so that it gave off a gas that would burn with a luminous flame. This technology was first installed in 1805 by Bolton and Watt at Salford Twist Mill and by Samuel Clegg at a cotton mill in Sarbury Bridge. It was substantially cheaper and much more efficient than candles and oil lamps. In May 1807, Beige, having heard that Strutt intended to install gas lighting in his mills, wrote to him that if this is true, it would be decisive, in my opinion, of the eligibility of the plan. Uh, um, that's, that's the letter. Um, in early 1808, uh, Beige visited a cotton mill near Manchester where gas lighting had been installed by Clegg and reported to Strutt in detail in a, in a letter following that uh, on the estimated costs of installing and running a gas lighting system, uh, which he was uh, planning to do for castle fields. Um, Marshall uh, was similarly interested in the potential of gas lighting, and in his notebooks are some careful calculations of the comparative costs of the two means of lighting, from which he concluded that he could light his mills at the same intensity as before for a fifth of the cost, or alternatively, provide five times as much light for the same cost. Accordingly, it is not much, it is not surprising that in 1811, Bolton and Watt were commissioned to install gas lighting at both Marshall's uh, Shrewsbury Mill and uh, the Benyon and Beige uh, Castlefields Mill. And these are the plans from the Bolton and Watt archive for those uh, where they prepared for those installations. Uh, and uh, in, in, in these cases, uh, these two mills uh, had gas lighting nearly 10 years before gas lighting uh, was established in the town. Um, as a, a minor footnote to this, uh, I note that in 1836, Peter Horseman, the manager of the flax mill, in his capacity as secretary of the uh, Shropshire Mechanics Institute, published a note on a water gas valve used at the flax mill and the local gas works. He published that in the Mechanics magazine. It's not clear from the context if it was developed at the flax mill or the gas works or by its manufacturer, who was based in Rosley. But it does, I feel, um, demonstrate a continuing uh, uh, emphasis on uh, improvement uh, in, in, tech, in the use of technology. Another rather fascinating uh, uh, development uh, uh, were uh, the so-called cluster houses. Uh, the opportunity provided by steam power to locate the flax mill on the outskirts of Shrewsbury meant that there was no need to provide a, a purpose-built settlement to attract workers for their new factory. However, when they purchased the site from John Mitten, the Marshall Partnership required that he build a series of quadripartite houses, later termed cluster houses, on the strip of land between the canal and the main road for them to then lease back from him. Um, and this is a copy of the um, plans that uh, they uh, gave him as part of that agreement. 
and then this is uh, teased out by historic England in in those uh, 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 you know, to show how it worked. Um, each block of these houses, cluster houses, comprised four homes under one hipped roof, each with uh, windows on two sides. Uh, on two sides. Initially, there were four blocks forming 16 houses. In about 1825, a second set of 16 houses were built. They were probably designed to accommodate skilled workers and artisans, uh, rather than just being uh, for gen general uh, uh, housing of factory hands. Uh, they did have rather generous uh, allocation of gardens to go with them, as you can see, both in this 1832 um, uh, map with the uh, two sets of uh, uh, cluster houses on it, um, and so on. Now, cluster houses are also known in the Derwent Valley, at Darley Abbey, which of course we've seen was Charles Beige's birthplace, and in Belper. There does not appear to be any firm evidence for the date of the surviving cluster houses in Derbyshire. So it is possible that the idea came from Beige and passed to Derbyshire, perhaps via Strutt. Alternatively, of course, um, uh, it could have gone the other way and that the uh, concept came from Derbyshire to, to, to um, uh, um, Beige and uh, the flax mill. Uh, but here, here, here we see uh, these cluster houses, both on the um, 1882 uh, Shrewsbury 1 to 500 OS map and the um, uh, Belper uh, 1 to 500 map. Returning to the uh, question of iron frame construction, um, uh, how, did, how did that progress? Well, I've already re referred to several more arm framed mill, arm framed mill buildings that were built in the years between 1801 and 1804 by George Lee at Salford Twist Mill, by Beige himself at Leeds and at Castlefields, and by Strass at North Mill Belper in 1804. And here's North Mill. Already new cross sections for the beams and ways of join the, joining the beams were being tried out and iron roof trusses were being developed for the first time. Um, by 1811, Murray, Fenton and Wood of Leeds, in addition to su the supply of steam engines and uh, the provision of uh, flax spinning machinery, were advertising themselves as the constructors of fireproof buildings. And they, they were probably responsible for a number of such buildings constructed between 1806 and 1814. These buildings have several features in common, namely cruciform section columns and inverted T-section beams. And these features are also shared at Marshall's Shrewsbury Mill uh, by a fax warehouse that was built about 1811 and the cross mill that uh, uh, having burnt down, a uh, traditional version of it having burnt down, uh, was rebuilt the iron frame in 1812. Uh, and also around this time, um, at the Castlefields Mill, uh, a, um, uh, a warehouse was built, uh, which later was turned into uh, housing. Uh, and so actually it does survive. Uh, and these are photos of, of the columns and beams and brick arches in, in, in that building. It has therefore been suggested that these later buildings uh, in, in Shrewsbury may be the work of, work of Matthew Murray, especially given his long-standing close working relationship with John Marshall in Leeds. Uh, furthermore, Murray supplied the steam engine uh, to the Bennion and Bayes' 1803 Meadow Lane Mill, and indeed probably uh, cast the iron frame uh, at his foundry. Uh, so he may also therefore himself contribute to its design as part of the interaction between the iron founder and the designer. Thus the intertwined 
uh, contribution to Beige, Strutt, Murray, and perhaps Hazeldine as well, can perhaps never be unpicked in the story of early iron framed buildings. Well, uh, what happened to uh, Beige next? <laughs> um, another enterprise in which both Beige and Strutt uh, were involved uh, in their respective communities was the establishment of Lancasterian schools. In a letter dated July 1812, Beige asked Strutt to give, give his committee uh, uh, an opinion on the uh, ceiling that Strutt's had had got in there uh, in the building they were using for a Lancasterian school because Lancaster himself had commented that he thought ceilings would cause noise problems. Um, um, well, we don't know whether uh, Strutt made any comments about this uh, uh, and, and what conclusion they came to, but we do know that the building, uh, the school designed by Beige was, was duly built on Castle Hill as depicted in this painting in Shrewsbury Muse Museum and Art Gallery. And there are the children trooping, trooping along the Dharma footpath. Um, in 1815, Beige had moved on from building fireproof buildings and flax spinning and its uh, 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 various uh, issues uh, by leaving his partnership with the Benyon brothers. By June 1816, he is writing to Strutt that being no longer a spinner and having little else to do, I've been constructing a loom on a plan quite new and I'm about to try it with a four horsepower. And uh, here's uh, some headed paper from his stationery. Um, this was a, a pioneering attempt to develop power looms for weaving linen. He built a single story uh, weaving shed in Kingston with a brick vaulted roof, 30 hand looms and 24 steam powered looms and employing 70 people. However, it doesn't appear that the uh, business really prospered and uh, perhaps it was just a bit too late. He was well into his 60s when he established this. He uh, died uh, age 70 in 1822. Uh, here's his uh, headstone in St. Chad's and his widow uh, eventually closed the business in 1826. However, although um, Beige's first 1796 iron frame design was soon superseded uh, and developed onwards, but nonetheless, he was the man who initiated a form of construction that would in due course underpin so many of the large and tall buildings of the present day. Thank you. Benny, thank you indeed. Fascinating. And um, uh, we've had, um, if, if anyone wants to ask any questions to Penny, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your page and you can submit those now. I do know we have one question and that is from Janet Tro, um, Penny, he wants to know, would Charles have made a scale model of the building to confirm his architectural plans and drawings, or was he confident the structure would, would work first time? Well, he does seem to have been amazingly confident, given that no one had really done this before. Um, we have no idea whether he would have uh, done a scale model. Uh, it, this was in the early days of um, structural engineering, uh, 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 and... Uh, so, uh, I mean, he certainly, uh, we know from the uh, later thing that he did carry out various experiments and he used the data from Joseph Reynolds. Uh, and I think he, maybe he was just one of these people who had confidence in his uh, uh, calculations and he just went ahead and did it. <laughs> I suppose, you know, you ask yourself, what's the worst that could happen? These things were, were, were burning to the ground on a, on a regular basis, yes, weren't yes. they, really? <laughs> but you, 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 one, one imagines that you, you think of the, the, 
the the exhaustive tests that go on these days when new buildings particularly uh, you know um high-rise buildings are being put together um that that w with the technologies that that these that beige and, and his, his cohort had no access to at all and i think it was just it, it strikes me as this huge courage that they had yes. in, in just stri striking on yes exactly yes very much so and and also that the i suppose we you know we 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 look at the building now and i have to say penny i mean i've had, had an interest in the fax mill for for many years and and, and looking at it now being reborn um it, it lifts the spirits to to, to you know we, a, a 10 years ago you know we would never have imagined we'd be, we'd be where we are now would we surely no i mean uh, it is quite uh, amazing i mean uh, well 10 years ago was when the friends of the fax mill was was uh, founded well uh, 2010 and uh, yeah. uh, yes i mean it was very much with the hope that we could help make things happen um uh, but it it was quite a, a quite a uh, you know a, an effort with lots of ups and downs but the great thing is that it is finally happening and uh, it really does look splendid now um uh, uh Every day, it, it looks a bit better. <laughs> yeah, well, you live quite close to it, so, you, so you're lucky enough oh, to I see, do, yeah. <laughs> see that. I mean, I, I spin by every every once in a while, every few months or so, and I'm, I'm just so excited by it. But this is an incredible period in Shropshire's history. You know, we've got we've got the flax mill being built, you know, down down uh, down or down river. You know, you've got the iron bridge being built, and there's this whole um, iron craze really, mm. um, and the, and that so many of the leading figures are, fr are from this part of the world. Oh, yes, yes. Or, or have come here like Telford, you know. I mean, he, he and, uh, you know, obviously goes on. Uh, and Hazeldine as well. Um, yes. He yeah. went on to an amazing career, building bridges all over the place. Um, uh, and uh, were, both were on in his own right and uh, um, in conjunction with Telford um, uh, and, and so on. Um, you, you meant you touched on earlier on, actually, Penny, and, the, and, and this interested me. Um, anyone who knows a little a, anything about the history of Sh Shrewsbury will know that it, you know the town grew rich on the back of Welsh sheep. But you mentioned the collapse of the wool industry in Shropshire. James Ballantyne's got a question on that. What 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 led to that? Was it was it cheaper manufacturing processes elsewhere? I mean, I know that once the once the the British Empire started to expand, we were we were getting goods cheaper all, all over the place, weren't we? Yes, well, uh, it's not my area of expertise. Um, I think Nigel Hinton has just uh, published a book about it, actually. Uh, um, uh, but, um, you know, I think it had just run its course. I mean, it was something that had been going on since, uh, you know, late Middle Ages and, 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 and reached its thing. And it was mainly buying up the wool from uh, Wales uh, and then finishing the processing and then uh, marketing it, um, you know, across the country and indeed to the continent. But it had just run its course, I think. Uh, and of course, there were new developments. I mean, obviously, uh, uh, the production of uh, woolen cloth was also had also got industrialized and so on. So, um, uh, no, it, it, it had, as far as I know, uh, you know, just sort of uh, like all industries, just like uh, the Marshall Company eventually uh, was superseded. It ran very successfully for nearly 100 years, um, but eventually, uh, 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 production had moved elsewhere, um, Ireland, Northern Ireland, and so on. Uh, and uh, the all industries uh, evolve and change. Um, John Trose um, makes a point. It seems amazing that funding ca came from these men's personal purses, whereas in our present day we're used to funding coming uh, coming from from many areas, not least from financial institutions, but there 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 was a very strong bond. I mean, you touched on Unitarianism, for mm. instance. That was a common factor, as indeed uh, the, the Derbys were Quakers. Mm. There was a there was almost a sort of a self support mechanism, wasn't there? Oh, very know, much so. I think people. yes. I mean, Strutt was also a Unitarian uh -huh, as well. Right. I mean, the more I've looked into it, you know, the more uh, you know these fascinating networks. Uh, of how they got to know each other and, uh, and whatever. And then, of course, there are political elements to all this as well um, uh, going on uh, behind the scenes. I mean, Robert Beige is someone I want to look into more because um, uh, uh, um, uh, he, 
uh, the uh, iron slitting mill I mentioned um, uh, that he uh, funded with uh, um, uh, Rasmus Darwin, um, they had uh, uh, that hit problems and it had to be closed down and sold off. Um, and at that point, he switched to writing novels. <laughs> and he wrote a number of novels, um, which are, uh, apparently, and of course I haven't read them yet, but I'm certainly going to have a look at them, uh, you know, really went into various political um, th issues of slavery, of uh, the role of women, uh, and this sort of thing. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised uh, that uh, Charles Beige also um, uh, had, had ideas on these things. I mean, you get occasional hints uh, and mentions of, uh, of current events in the letters. Um, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, yes, there were, uh, you know, they, they certainly did um, uh, discuss all sorts of matters between themselves. Um, but of course, we, we only know about that when letters and correspondence and, and publications and pamphlets survive. Yes. And for yeah. Beige, we literally only really have these letters. <laughs> Such a shame. Yes. But we, you mentioned Erasmus Darwin, and of course, mm. he and Josiah Wedgwood were in the Lun Lunar Society together. Josiah Wedgwood was an abolitionist. Yes, um, yes, and we, and we, yes. Know, we, we know from Darwin's own autobiography what his views on, on were all that. So they, they shared a great deal more than just an interest in in industry and technology, didn't yes. they? And maybe maybe that's that's the, the the thread that ties them together, perhaps. Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, there is a list of uh, you know because there was a Shropshire committee for the abolition of uh, uh, the slave trade. Um, now, Beige isn't on the list of the people that formed that, but I, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he didn't participate because quite a lot of the other people that he would have known and mixed with in, in his circle. You know, it was a fairly small town with a, you know, uh, a fairly small uh, core of the great and the good, um, uh, you know, to mingle with. Uh, so I wouldn't be at all surprised if he was involved. You mentioned, I think, Wilkinson. I mean, uh, uh, Frank Oldacre, thank you for your question, Frank. He's asking whether there's any other evidence of, of any other collaboration with, with leading figures in, in, in Colebrookdale. Um, uh, well, uh, not, not as regard Beige, but I'm, 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 I, I don't think so. But, you know, I can't pretend that I've looked into all of this in, 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 in the detail that it deserves. Um, I mean, I really only researched this in the last month or so, um, and I had to rely on on what I could find on the internet. Yeah, there's some there's, libraries or whatever. Yeah, um, and it, it's unearthed. It's, it's the, you know there are names that that because there are so mm. many names involved. We, we we hang on to sort of half a dozen or so: Wilkinson and the yeah, Darbys yeah. and what have you. But yeah. it's all these other other ancillary characters. I mean, you know, Darby. Abraham Darby built the world's first iron bridge. Well, actually, no, Thomas Farnell's Pritchard was the chap who designed it, you know, and he yeah, doesn't get yeah. he, he gets little credit. <laughs> um, interesting question from James Ballantyne. I don't know if, if, whether or not you'd be able to answer this, um, Penny, but it's re really about the positioning of the flax mill where it was in Shropshire, you know, as opposed to Leeds, whatever. You know, were, were we, we were producing a lot of flax in, in this part of the... Uh, oh, no, I mean... Flax here? No, the reason it was built in Shrewsbury, one assumes, is because uh, the Benyon brothers, I mean, obviously, uh, Benjamin Benyon was still living in Shrewsbury, uh, mm. and uh, that's where they were based, or they had been based. Um, but I think the reason they built it here was because they knew Charles Beige had ideas or had the potential to build them a fireproof mill. Uh, they did rebuild their one in Leeds, but they were looking to try and get around this problem of it and they knew that he had ideas or at least could develop the ideas that were swilling around with William Strutt uh, and others for how you could um, you know produce these fireproof mills so that was the reason why it came to Shrewsbury um, the flax most of the flax that was uh, used there was um, uh, imported quite a lot of it from the con continent in fact um, uh, the main sources of flax that uh, Marshall um, used um, came from uh, uh, Northern Europe, um, uh, 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 the Netherlands, Belgium, uh, and uh, uh, there was also a lot, a lot of flax that came from the Baltic and so on. 
And of course, one, one, one point about plaques, which I, I shouldn't imagine really figured hugely in their thinking, but of course, it, 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 unlike cotton, it didn't have the uh, taint of slavery with it. Uh, yeah. which uh, is quite nice to think at yeah. least but, uh, but I yes. suppose you, you see when you look at how, how the complex of buildings is developed and it's and it's it's it basically demonstrates that if you've got a, a, you know a source of water if you've got transport connections and 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 a source of of labor then I suppose yes you can put you, you put your mill wherever you want mm. to and, and yeah. increasingly they move from you know, uh, sort of semi-rural settings, and move move into the you know the dark satanic mills of Salford yeah, and, yes. and Birmingham and what have you. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, uh, uh, that was the great uh, uh, be benefit of, of of the development of the steam powers, the steam engines. Um, uh, as long as you could could get the coal uh, and your raw materials, you were away, and uh, and that's why these uh, places. Uh, which started off relatively small, um, uh, expanded. Shrewsbury didn't, but potentially it could have become another Leeds, but it didn't. <laughs> Probably just as well. Yes, yes, as much of a size how it is. <laughs> We're okay. We've got the we've got the world's yeah. first iron frame exactly. building. We, we, <laughs> We're good. <laughs> We're good. Penny, this is absolutely fascinating. Thank you, thank you so much for uh, for talk, talking to us this evening. Um, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us this, this evening as well. And uh, just remains for me to thank our speaker, Penny Ward, and you for joining us. And to encourage you to visit the festival website for details of the remaining events in this year's programme, darwin.originalshrewsbury.co.uk. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, you, Penny.